So welcome everybody uh, to the panel on driving the digital health revolution. It's really exciting to be here. And uh, I just thought I would open up by reflecting a little bit about on you know, what I've heard over the last evening and, and half a day, and that's that it's just such a time of incredible discovery and acceleration, especially in health and technology, um, from the cellular level, if you will, where we're applying incredible computation to our genomes and our proteomes and more, all the way to the macro level, right, uh, in terms of innovating um, how we define the boundaries of health, extending that definition of health into our lives, into our communities, um, our social networks, our environment, our workplace, our schools. So it was really interesting to sort of see this uh, transformation happening uh, both at the, at the micro level and the macro level. Um, and the digital health revolution on its own has had a trajectory of the last uh, number of years with advance, advancements in sensor technology, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, you name it. Uh, and it's spawned now thousands of companies uh, in marketplaces around the world. And uh, I think this year alone, uh, I think by July of this year, uh, these companies had raised anywhere between 3.5 to $6.5 billion, depending on who you read. Um, so it's fair to say, I think, that our expectations couldn't be any higher. Uh, where we are now in terms of this convergence and the opportunities uh, in, ahead of us. Um, but this panel will be tackling some interesting questions given all of that context, and that is, can we incentivize the adoption and scale of these technologies where they're needed the most, especially in prevention, as you've heard a lot of discussion about at the conference so far? Does technology help with access to care or does it create more of a divide? What is the role of the provider in this new world? Um, and can we find ways for them to organically leverage technology instead of adding to an already over full plate? Uh, will regulation keep up or fall behind? And uh, will the new digital health companies find customers and business models that satisfy their investors and their sort of own entrepreneurial drive? So with me today is a wonderful panel of people who couldn't, I couldn't possibly assemble uh, better people to help us answer these questions and, 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 and have a conversation. So let me introduce them to you. Starting at the far left is Cindy Elkins. She's the co-founder and chief operating officer of MyWays, uh, which is a uh, technology platform offered by Fortune 1000 companies to help their employees navigate the world of non-clinical care coordination. We're gonna be hearing more about that, uh, which involves things like helping patients and caregivers quickly create their care teams, communicate securely and easily, and rapidly match requests for help with offers for help. She's also a board member of Weight Watchers, and we'll be bringing that perspective to bear in our conversation. Uh, to her right is Don Jones. He's the Chief Digital Officer of Scripps Translational Science Institute, uh, which I just learned holds the largest NIH grant <laughs> in the history, part of its Precision Medicine Initiative. Before that, Don um, headed up Qualcomm's Wireless Health Global Strategy, where he founded the healthcare division, also conceived of the X Prize. I I'm sure many of us have heard of that, uh, the $10 million tricorder prize for consumer devices uh, to make medical diagnoses. So uh, thank you for joining us, Paul. Um, to my right is Karen DeSalvo, who was most recently the Acting Assistant Secretary for Health at the U.S. Department of uh, Health and Human Services, uh, and where she led core public health offices and oversaw development of policy recommendations, including something called Public Health 3.0, which is a vision for the future of public health. Um, she was also the leader of something called the Delivery System Reform Strategy at HHS, where um, it proved to have some really wonderful outcomes in terms of payment. And of course, she was the National Coordinator for Health IT, joining a long uh, list of you know, illustrious people in that role before and before that New Orleans Health Commissioner. commissioner. To my left is Esther Dyson. Uh, she's the executive founder of Way to Wellville and Adventure Holdings. So um, Esther's been an active angel investor in a number of companies in the space, including Omada Health, and um, who we're gonna get to in a moment, Startup Health, Chronology, and many more companies. She's also a board member of 23andMe uh, and a number of other companies, and will be talking to us today wearing many of those hats. Um, Last but not least, we have Paul Chu, who is the Chief Medical Officer for Amada Health, a digital therapeutics company that's offering sort of tracking and monitoring technologies for consumer health combined with coaching. Um, and this idea is to, is to have this sort of technology-enabled service to prevent chronic disease. And prior to this position, um, Paul comes from the the pharmaceutical industry for 24 years, uh, where he headed up the uh, global medical office at Sanofi. So that's who's on the panel today. And I'm actually gonna start with 
Paul uh, kicking us off on this conversation. As we think first about, you know, broadly speaking, the drivers and the incentives for the adoption and scale of the digital health revolution. So Paul, um, you know, on the Amato website, which I was just looking at, you know, it says that the CDC has called chronic disease the public health challenge of the 21st century. And you've said most recently that behavioral economics <laughs> has now finally become, you know, a respectable field, if you will, and it's matured and uh, said something very really compelling. And that is that that means we can now use the patient as their own cure. So what does that mean? Well, thank you very much, Indu. You know, the, uh, the revolution is uh, not only in digital health, but in what uh, people are going to die of. Number one is heart disease. Number two is uh, diabetes-related and cancer-related diseases. If you look to the right and left of you, probably you're seeing a pre-diabetic patient. And uh, most people don't realize it. And the important aspect of it is that it will not only affect not only affect uh, the lives of uh, people with stroke, uh, eye disease, blindness, carotid disease, heart, it's the king of diseases. It strikes you from the head to your toe. And it's a debilitating disease, and many of you know people with it. What we now know is that the intervention to reduce the risk of diabetes is within the hands of people. Patients can be their own cure. But it involves a change in behavior, and that is not easy. So the Diabetes Prevention Program, which was published in 2002 in the New England Journal, showed that intensive behavioral counseling on lifestyle and diet could reduce the incidence of diabetes by more than half, 58%, compared with a drug, metformin, which is only 31%. What OMADA has done is realize that there are 84 million people at risk for prediabetes. You can't have, have a coach, a personal coach for each one of them. So we've developed a digital approach, combining human coaching, innovative design to make the program attractive, as well as social support with an online group. And with over 120,000 participants to date, we're the largest digital therapeutic company in the space. So patients can be their own cure. That, that's really um, powerful, and, and the growth of Amada and that story is really compelling. Um, but Paul, even though we know about the data and the clinical trials and the evidence, and we now have the technology platform, um, what is it going to take to incentivize physicians uh, to screen and, and make these referrals? Well, it, it's, it's rather shocking, Indu, because there's virtually a Mount Everest of clinical data from China, the US, Finland. There are 30 studies over the last 15 years that shows that behavioral intervention is effective and durable. In a recent uh, survey at Johns Hopkins, my old uh, school, I'm uh, embarrassed to say that at a meeting there, uh, th they weren't all from Hopkins, but there was at a meeting there of, uh, of uh, primary care physicians, only 15% knew the criteria for diagnosing prediabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not surprising, therefore, that 90% of people with prediabetes don't know about it. So we need to do a much better job of education, but it's more than education. We need carrots and sticks. Uh, last week in the New England Journal, there was an editorial published on the, uh, the uh, Zika uh, epidemic and the recommendation that mothers who have Zika antibodies should have their babies tested and have neuroimaging. Well, that has been pathetically implemented. So it's recommended that you have carrots and sticks. One of the carrots, of course, is to have incentives uh, for certification, that you have to have a certain practice level of care and prevention if you want to remain certified. And the stick is you don't get certified. Uh, so that I think we have to have behavioral approaches not only to the participant, but also to the healthcare provider. Now, uh, uh, I'll stop after this. It's not that doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners are sitting by the phone waiting for us to say, what else can I do because I have so much time on my hands. They have tons of uh, things to do, two hours a day just keeping up with the medical records. So we have to develop ways in which this will fit into the workflow and in fact reduce the burden of time they spend. Thank you so much. Um, so Esther, sort of picking up on that, um, 
I'd love you to tell the audience a little bit about the approach that you're using in the way to Velville, and specifically around the fact that you don't necessarily need a trained clinician when you enter the world of sort of digital health, and you've called it the digital curriculum, if right. you will. So um, please speak with us. So to some extent, I'm, I'm an early investor in Omada, and precisely because of that, I couldn't really promote them in the five communities that are part of Wellville. The, the basic idea is these are communities underserved, fairly bounded. So if, if things change within the community, that really affects everybody there. It's, it's not so much a precision medicine person by person, though I'll come back to that at the end. Uh, what we're trying to do is help the communities do what they want to do with a little bit of guidance. So I'll, I'll just give you an example. In Muskegon, which is my community, 180,000 people on the shores of Lake Michigan, they have a YMCA with a diabetes prevention program that serves a few hundred people a year. And I said to them, well, gee, imagine what you could do if you actually would scale this. What would that be like? And she said, well, we, we have three coaches. We could do 10 classes with 10 people apiece twice a year. And I said, no, think, think a little more grandiosely. So since then, one thing we're doing, we're working with Meyer, the grocery chain, that they do prediabetes screenings. And then normally they say, you're a pre-diabetic, go see your doctor. And then nothing happens and they buy some cupcakes and it's over. <laughs> uh, so we're trying to help communities understand, in a sense, I come from Silicon Valley, that's why I'm always on digital health panels, even though it's, there's, there's more to it than that. Uh, but what Silicon Valley does do is it scales, it has accountability, it looks at rollouts, and if something's not working, it doesn't say, oh, the idea is wrong. It says, let's tinker until it works. So whether it's pre-diabetes in Muskegon or early childhood education, the, the basic notion, I would say, around digital health in our communities is really two. It's this digital curriculum, whether it's pre-diabetes prevention or some protocol for marital counseling, because if you, if the parents communicate well with one another, they will probably be much better parents for the children and reduce the amount of ACEs and, and overall stress. Uh, and you can have that digital curriculum delivered by local people who need training. It's not just, you know, go find them at Meyer and get them a new job, but take the curriculum, give them some serious training, and then people are much more likely to listen to the lady who lives down the street than some white woman from New York. So that's, that's the basic idea. The other is we keep talking about precision medicine around drugs and genomes. I think we also need to think about precision medicine around behavioral sensitivity. You, know, you might want to go running with your friends. Someone else might want to race their friends. Someone else, they're motivated by seeing their da daughter graduate. You know, what, figure out what it is that the person is going to be motivated by and then use that. And it's going to be very different among different people. Yeah, I, I like the idea of how Wade Wellville is innovating on the idea of delivery, using kind of local communities as a way of delivery and then sort of precision medicine in terms of sort of customizing to behavioral you know, uh, dimensions. So I think really interesting. Um, so Don, uh, sitting uh, to Esther's left, um, there's an incredible convergence now between broadly speaking the life sciences and broadly speaking information technology. And you've really, I think, been at that intersection for so many years. I'd love you to share with this audience what is kind of most exciting on your radar, but also speak a little bit about this idea of the incentive to adopt and scale and kind of how you're seeing this from, from that market perspective. So I spent the last 15 years working predominantly on the health and medical device side and getting them moving towards connectivity and various business models there. What's exciting today is connected drugs. So this is actually the pharmaceutical coming in some form of packaging. It can be actually in the pharmaceutical vis-a-vis -vis technology like Proteus has where the 
connectivity is provided in the pill. It can be in the packaging around in the form of an injector, an inhaler, for example, that's actually connected, uh, or in any, any number of number of forms, drug delivery patches that are also have connectivity and sensors co combined. And so that's the area where I'm spending a lot of time today. And it really means that pharmaceuticals are enter entering the world of Internet of Things, or Internet of Medical Things, if you prefer to express it that way. Uh, and it means that uh, you'll get a prescription that actually is meant to be connected as you're using the therapy. So it's a different form of digital therapy. There's digital therapies that are software. There's digital therapies that are software and drug com com combinations. And there's digital therapies where the therapy itself is, is a connected product. Mm -hmm. I think that that's really interesting. And uh, you know, we're going to come back and, and dig more into, into sort of how that um, fits in into kind of different payment models, et cetera. But from your perspective, uh, just with that evolution, what do you see as you know the implication for, for physicians? So I think um, the, the biggest change we're going to see is not going to come from any of the digital technologies. It's going to come from payment changes. And when physicians, whether they're participating through bundled payments or other forms of more um, broad capitation, that's where you actually see uh, uh, an openness from the physician side. That being said, I'm a big believer that a lot of the early adoption is going to become from organizations that actually figure out how to deliver care. It may not be physician owned and run, but may actually employ or partner with physicians. So uh, a good example would be Lavongo, which takes care of diabetes patients, where they actually create a new business model, reach out to employers, capture the dollars, start managing the diabetes, they bring the physicians to the patient base rather than expecting the patient base to go to the physicians. And I think you're gonna see a lot more examples like that where you essentially are restructuring the care delivery outside of the traditional ways of hospitals and physician groups uh, because frankly, they're the slow movers. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. So uh, just to put into context what, what Don was, was just saying, we were talking earlier today about kind of thinking about digital health and how it's adopted in, in sort of three ways, you know, one, that existing entities like sort of like the Kaisers and the Cedars Sinai's of the world adopt, you know, utilize technology to do what they, what they do. Um, I think the sort of second notion of there being new models of care delivery like a, you know, um, Oscar or an, an Iora, uh, either building their own technology or adopting other digital health technologies. And the third is what Don was just saying, which is the technology platform itself reverse engineering into a service and care delivery model. And I think increasingly with digital therapeutics, everything you just shared with us, uh, that's an extremely disruptive potential. Uh, so I think that that's exciting. Um, so Cindy, uh, in wearing your lens of both the startup founder and COO and being on the board member, uh, being on the board of Weight Watchers, um, you've spent a lot of time thinking about uh, what you've sort of described as our natural humanity mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and how that plays out in, in new tech platforms. So I'd yeah. uh, love to, you to elaborate on Super. that. Thanks, Indu. So uh, a little bit of background. Um, I was uh, I grew up in the Silicon Valley. Uh, like Esther, I, I came from there as well. And I'm a technologist. I remember the first uh, VCR my parents got. Super exciting. <laughs> Connected it to the TV where you actually had to change the channel. By mm -hmm. hand, yep, dating myself a little bit. Um, but uh, Silicon Valley, nine years at Genentech, running the technology organization, and now doing a startup. And I'm um, super excited to share with you kind of the genesis of that idea. So what I'm interested in right now is this intersection of four circles. So being a math major, I love Venn diagrams. So imagine my four circles, health, technology, gratitude, and engagement. So when you think about, um, if you looked at the Gallup survey results, right, 56% of workers are uh, not engaged. Another 16% are actively disengaged, like they're working against you every minute of every day, <laughs> right? Um, and then you really look at gratitude, and the senator last night talked about the science of happiness and some of the great work that's happening at the Greater Good Science Center out of Berkeley. Um, and this, I was just stunned by this research by the Templeton Foundation about saying thank you, right? Does thank you make you feel good? 
yeah, I love saying thank you. I love hearing it. Do you do it? Eh, not really. You know, maybe 10% of the people said they'd maybe do it once a day. Maybe uh, they do it once a year. So at this intersection of health, technology, engagement, and gratitude came this idea for my ways, which was how do we ignite humanity's capacity to care for each other? Loftiest vision we could make up. So what I was so struck by uh, in all my time at Genentech was that any time somebody was needing help, someone in their family was diagnosed with cancer, for example. My dad was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, my uncle with kidney cancer, my grandma with wet macular degeneration. Um, this just beautiful invisible network sprung into action. And it almost became everyone's top priority to offer help. And if we got better at requesting help or understanding how we could ask for help better, it felt like there was this natural opportunity to do that. So what we're looking at is really helping the 40 million caregivers in the United States, right? And this isn't a job you can turn down. Right? Somebody says, hey, I've been diagnosed with cancer or diabetes, et cetera. I watched my mom go through it twice. Immediately, she steps into a caregiver role. So we're looking at how do we build um, a support network, a community that includes not only your family and friends, but now moving into the corporation as a source of capacity to bring health, gratitude, and ultimately, the payback into the corporation is through engagement, through knowing that these folks that you spend most of your waking hours with really need your help. And so that's, um, I mean, being a technologist, what I love is that we can use it to really tap into the greater goodness in all of us. And so having the opportunity to, to be part of that is, uh, is pretty exciting. Thank you so much. Yeah, I had to. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I agree. Uh, somebody said, you know, I think it was Senator Sassy who said, I don't think Facebook friends are real friends. I was like, that's not true. I do get a lot of, you know, positive vibes from, from my social network. So I, I hear that. Um, You've curated them well. <laughs> <laughs> Unfriended. Um, so Karen, I, I saved, you know, you last, because I wanted you to kind of hear these different perspectives. You really, you know, saw from everybody so far uh, speak about the different dimensions of this digital health revolution. And I, you know, you've had such a bird's eye view in all of the roles you've played. And I, something that you said that I'd love you to elaborate on is how you think of generating health without healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, and what are the ways in which the tools that you have at the policy level um, and delivery design level, how do those help you think about that challenge? Well, um, let me just start by saying that from a technology standpoint, I think we're all seeing that technology is improving the efficiency, the effectiveness, uh, the scope of care. And uh, though it hasn't driven down cost in the way that I think many of us had, had hoped and continue to hope, it, it's that sort of um, changing of the current business model, maybe you'd say building a better mousetrap, important. Um, but what's also happening I think is important, which is, that people are beginning to think about um, how, to, how to conceive of health and, and uh, address health beyond the, the traditional healthcare system. So clinical excellence, a great healthcare system is only gonna get us so far, maybe if we're lucky, 20% of the way, but the other determinants of health really have a big impact on, on health outcomes and cost and satisfaction. And so this, um, in the middle space of health beyond healthcare is this bridging the intersection, the partnership between healthcare and public health and business and social services. I think largely, honestly, um, social services and healthcare working more and more together to think about the social determinants. What are the uh, conditions in which um, people are living, learning, working, and playing? Is somebody going to bed hungry? And that's the reason that they're readmitted to the hospital, not because the, the care for their heart failure wasn't perfect. And so as we get better using technology for patient reported outcomes, for uh, remote sensing, helping people understand what's happening in their home context, I think we're adding more information and able to act on it. But we're beginning that journey or adventure. We still have a lot to learn. And if that's not enough, I think at the same time, what I'm seeing happening is um, this health without healthcare. And for the public health people here, like myself, 
uh, we would recognize this as going back to the roots of public health, which is the society creating the conditions in which everyone can be healthy. It's thinking about some of the foundational components of our built environment, safe water, clean air, sidewalks, smoke-free environment. Um, but really, the, what's happening is that it's not just about public health um, reimagining its responsibility and role in addressing the social determinants of health, thinking broadly, including sort of the built environment, making the healthy choice the easy choice. So it's not just telling people what to, to choose, but making sure that it's available. But it's more than that. I think technology and consumerism and more out-of-pocket costs and all these other factors are, are colliding to create a world in which um, it's, a, it's a, uh, a reality that you have an echo dot in your kitchen that you can ask questions of that may give you as good of responses as a board certified clinician would. So you can have a conversation with a clinician in your kitchen and ask questions and that may or may not lead to some package being dropped off at your doorstep to alleviate that headache that you're asking about. So it's, um, and I would say that that's a sickness model still, but there is a health opportunity there of really empowering people about their their own prediabetes or their opportunities to, to stay healthy, whether it's because of air quality or just because they want to make better choices about eating. The, the opportunities are almost endless, and I'm not one of those futurists, um, so I can't begin to imagine what the world will be like in 10 years, but I can look back 10 years or 12 years if I could, which maybe we'll talk about Katrina, but at the time of Katrina, um, when we were on the street taking care of people, we were using flip phones. None, not I had never texted. I'm sure some other people had. Uh, we didn't have the kind of basic technology then that we even have now. And so the scalar leap we're taking, I think, is really exciting. The, the goal there, though, is, is that people, as they become engaged and empowered, they're a part of a bigger system that's supporting them, public health, health care, social services, their employers. Um, and that, that that isn't just a bunch of data, but it's really actionable information um, that, can, that can help them make, make really good choices. We're seeing some, again, some models of it. We're seeing some experimentation, but I don't think it's very long until um, the healthcare system, until doctors wake up and there's some inter intermediaries there that aren't the emergency room or nurse practitioners um, or uh, urgent care centers. There's, there's something else that has stepped in between us and that, that doctor-patient relationship. And I, I, I think maybe um, not speaking as a public health person, but speaking as a doctor, um, that that's a incredibly important for us just to recognize that the consumers are demanding and there's a response to that demand, that they have more information at their fingertips and don't need an intermediary to get to it, mm -hmm. and that maybe they can achieve health, maintain health um, without actually having to use the healthcare system, but leverage some other opportunities that are emerging in the marketplace. Yeah, and I think that's a great segue. Yeah, I, I think that uh, as I was listening to some of the comments, it's really important that uh, to realize somebody's got to pay for this. Mm -hmm. And the people who pay would like to see value. Mm -hmm. uh, now at Omada, we did something that was very difficult in the pharmaceutical industry where I came from, was at Omada you pay for outcomes. If the patients don't lose weight, there's no, there's no payment except for the startup cost. And so that's very important that people can see that the company is sharing the risk with the payer. So I think that's a model that we have to realize that there, you know, there's going to be 40,000 fewer primary care doctors by 2030. There are going to be 70 million people over 65 where you have diabetes and chronic disease. So money is not going to be that available. So a pay for performance. The other one, and I, I think this was brought up by, um, uh, by Esther, Tinkering. You don't tinker with a with a pharmaceutical product. You have a fixed manufacturing and pharmaceutical components. You don't tinker with it. That's quite the opposite with the digital technology. It's constantly learning. It never sleeps. People are different. They respond differently. They engage differently. They they participate differently. And so from these pattern patterns of behavior, you get a almost looks like a gene chip. You can see when they're signing in, when they're signing off, and correlate that with weight loss. So you build up this relationship between those who lose weight and they, they do certain things. And so what the health coach can do is personalize mm -hmm. because they will get a clue or a hint from the machine, this person is not going on the right track. We suggest you make an intervention before they go off the tracks. So, it's, so that dynamic approach to, to a digital uh, therapeutics is, is what's so important. It's personalizing. It's also uh, uh, making the payment based on results, 
And the, the final thing, the reason I went to Omada is that in the end, uh, there won't be as many digital therapeutic companies as there are now in the space. I mean, that's the history of things, that there's a lot at the beginning and fewer at the end. But the ones that'll last are the ones that do clinical <laughs> research to show that their platform works. We know the DPP works, it was in the New England Journal. This is a digital version. You have to show that it works with peer-reviewed publications so that people who pay have some inkling that there's something behind the promotion. Before, thank you for that. And before we, we move on, I want you to just add one more perspective there, the customers. So are your, I guess, primarily whether those are provider systems or, or you know, uh, mm -hmm. stakeholder organizations, you know, you said something like, digital health isn't the sort of category that they have in an organized yes. way as they're going through you their list of... You don't knock on the door and say, oh, <laughs> the Office of Digital Therapeutics. Right. There, there is nothing like that. How is that customer maturing? And well, are they able to... We're conditioning them. We're conditioning <laughs> them. Uh, first of all, you have to have the medical goods. Does it work? So the medical group is extremely important that they become engaged and aware and participatory in the discussion. Because if the medical people say no, there's no need to go anywhere else. Uh, so if medical uh, conditions are right, th that it's a credible, demonstrated value, then you have to talk with the people such as human resources or uh, benefits and the chief financial officer. So you have to have the answers to the questions they're looking for, which often is the degree of patient engagement. And in the case of Omada, 80% feel better about their insurance company than they ever did, because here they got a benefit, they weren't even sick. So how do patients engage? How do they feel about the program? Uh, what's the ROI? So it's important that you do ROI, and it's even better if somebody else does the ROI, to show that you have a value to the program. So that uh, in time, there will be a, uh, a way for payers, stakeholders, <coughs> and enterprises to assess. But there was a great article by Joe uh, uh, Kevdar uh, in the Harvard Business Review last November on a checklist which companies should go through in looking at digital technologies. And it's many of the things I said, uh, that you really should kick the tires. Great. Um, just, I mean, I sort of feel a lot of this stuff is really cool and I love it, but at some point for the Medicaid population, there's, there's a kind of lower cost of entry and a huge value just keeping them connected to the system because Medicaid customers churn like every eight and a half months. And if you can just keep that, I've got this, I'm an investor in this company called WellPass that does text for baby. And so that, you know, these people don't have doctors by and large. When you find out you're pregnant, it turns out you're very valuable to an insurance company. But then, the real value is indeed in keeping you connected, keeping you out of the ICU, making sure you get your kid vaccinated, that you stop smoking at the same time. And these, these are not even medical interventions mostly, but they're tremendously important. Well, well let me just add into uh, Esther's that we, we see, and many see, that the digital revolution is a way to reduce the digital divide, to reduce disparities in healthcare. So we have <coughs> a, a program that's still being built looking at um, access for low literacy and for Spanish-speaking people because that's where there's a lot of diabetes and diabetes risk. And it's a mobile technology and almost everybody has a, a cell phone, a smartphone. So it's still early days, but uh, it is something that is really where the risk is. So uh, can I just tell one really brief story? I'm, I was meeting with the head of a Native American tribe in California and asking him, what are the big problems? Diabetes, look at me, I'm 300 pounds. My mother lost a leg. We just need the health system to offer bariatric surgery more broadly. <laughs> and yeah, that's the reality, but sorry, keep going. No, 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 I, I, I think that, that, that to sort of Stay on this topic of you know how do we translate all of this into into reality and and speaking of the sort of payment issue that that Paul raised, I wanted to say you know you said something about returns don't always go back to the pocket that paid for them. So how are you uh, at weight of Wellville 
looking at the issue of investment and return because it's not in the sort of traditional way. Yeah. Exactly. So Way to Wellville is totally nonprofit, to be totally clear. It's, it's a 10-year project. We're not trying to build a foundation. And to some extent, what we're trying to do is simulate in these communities what it would be like if, quote, the collective society paid for diabetes prevention, for early childhood education, for nurse family partnership. And what we're going to be doing all your usual medical metrics, but what we really want to see is the mayor gets reelected, housing prices go up, employers, you know, maybe not Amazon, but employers move into town, uh, kids graduate, the jails are empty, and that's the sort of thing that a community will pay for if they believe in it. But they, you know, there's lots of things like what we're doing. We're not unique or special or particularly innovative, but to do five of them with fundamentally the same overall approach and say, if those jokers in Muskegon could do it, so can you. That's, that's our goal. It's really fascinating. And then tell the politicians and go for it. So sort of, sort of philanthropy is the bridge to, to proving value and then hopefully it sort of, you know, then becomes a s sustainable um, market activity. But Don, you've, you've been thinking a lot about this idea of, um, Again, you know, th that revenue, chasing the revenue for these digital health companies. So, so share a little bit about how you see this playing out as these tech companies scale. So I'll first start with a common denominator that I think I find in almost every successful digital health company, and that is they bring an element of convenience that far surpasses what's otherwise available in the healthcare system. That's how you attract the customers and how you build on. So really, I, I have a slide that I use that says convenience is the glue. And, and the convenience could be solving any number of problems. The convenience could have nothing to do with the service or the product or the diagnostic or the therapy you're offering. The convenience might be that you've ma managed your particular service with Lyft and you're giving rides. So it's an element that actually changes the dynamics of the c customer interaction. And I think almost every company I've ever come across that's, that's on the growth curve, that's succeeding, uh, solves some element of the convenience equation. And it's really easy to do. Because healthcare, if you think about it, and all your personal experiences, is really inconvenient. <laughs> <laughs> and low bar. Low bar. <laughs> it's a very low bar. I like to say that, listen, you can get into this field easy because most of the early opportunities, you're not taking the low-hanging fruit, you're picking it up off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that, it's that low. Yeah. So, um, so that's, what, that's kind of the starting point. And, and I do a talk that I call the, the, um, the rise of the interlopers, which are folks in healthcare that are coming along taking advantage of how you enter into the market by picking up the low hanging and fruit on the, on the ground. And then you start providing services to folks who begin to take advantage of the fact you're building trust. And then they c will start looking for you for more services. And as you're looking for more revenue, you're saying, well, instead of just supplying the monitoring service I might be supplying, maybe I provide the monitoring service and some peripherals. Maybe I take that further and actually start providing some therapy management. Maybe I take it further and provide the professional piece. Pretty soon I'm in the position where I'm capturing all the dollars available for that disease area or that particular service because I'm actually going vertically integrated. I've taken the technology and turned it into a vertically integrated technology enabled service all the way up through professional services. And how is that playing competitively vis-a-vis -vis -vis incumbents in this world of sort of, you know, uh, risk yeah. and so for the most part, and there are some clear exceptions, but physician groups and hospitals don't change very well, very fast or very rapidly. So this is being done outside of traditional providers for the most part. And effectively, they're, they're nibbling at the edges of the revenue streams. And the question is, is really for some of these, for some locales around the country is, you know, will they wake up one day and find their waiting room empty, wondering what happened? And I think there, you know, we're starting to see a few examples where you can kind of say that's starting, the evidence is kind of starting to show that you can create a business model that sucks it out of the traditional system, uses convenience as the glue to pull people into a model. You start getting a trust and a brand. We've had traditional trusted brands like Mayo and Cleveland, but now maybe the new trusted brand is Omada. And then they start making referrals and they start effectively functioning as the place I go to answer the question of what do I need to do next, which includes where do I need to go, who do I need to see, et cetera, et cetera. So it changes the, everything we think about in terms of referral patterns. 
So l at the end of the day here, the individual tech-enabled service companies will grow in the services, try and rise up with the revenue opportunities that they can do by rising right higher and higher on the scale, and then they'll become the, the point of customer connection, and uh, which will be very different than perhaps the traditional medical providers would imagine the world might look like. I, I, I do remember using Amazon to just buy books more cheaply at one point. <laughs> it's just a, another way to buy books, and now, now look what's happened. Um, so, so Cindy, um, while all this is happening in the sort of technology platform world and the provider disruption and in communities, um, you know, you have a, a window into employers mm -hmm. um, and into uh, kind of consumer, pure consumer play, mm -hmm. you know, with, with Weight Watchers. What are you seeing in terms of um, how people see their roles yeah. in, in this current marketplace? Yeah, so um, one of the things I wanted to share um, that I've, I've gotten to see at Weight Watchers, which, you know, founded in 1963 by Gene Neidich, is like the original social construct of helping one another, um, is just this beautiful um, area called Connect and um, launched in just like the late 2015. Um, it's like happy Facebook is my best <laughs> description of it. If you want a dose of just unbridled um, support, motivation, compassion, kick in the butt if you need it, um, just open authentic sharing, um, it, it's beautiful. And over a million members post in the Connect Zone uh, on the app every single month. And so what, what it continues to show me, because I think we saw this in um, banking, we've seen it in shopping, we've seen it in healthcare, you now this whole conference about really kind of the rise of the individual and that all of this technology has got to make it simpler, right? and we will not settle for less. You know, we don't even want to go to the bank now to deposit money, right? Like, I deposited a check in my house and my mom's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I'm gonna take a picture of it and it's gonna deposit the money. She's like, oh my God, <laughs> you, should, you should go to the bank. I'm like, no, it's okay, mom, I got it. Uh, but, um, you know, and you think about um, the consumer in the healthcare space and, and all about the quantified self, I want to know more about me because I want to lead a healthier life, right? I do want to feel better. Like I believe, I'm very optimistic about this innate desire to lead the healthiest life we can. Now, does that mean I don't eat well sometimes? Yes, I do not eat well sometimes. But, but leave those trade-offs to me, right? And put me in charge of how I want to navigate this system and, and how I want to connect into it and then um, very specifically, how I can connect to more people like me, right? So um, how do we reinforce these connections across this network so that all the burden isn't on the payer or on the provider or on the employer, but in fact that we've really unleashed this enormous capacity amongst ourselves to cheer each other on, to be there when it's a hard day. Um, to show a path that perhaps I, I've been down and I want to tell you about, that, that you're ready to go on, Don, right? And I don't want you to have to struggle with what I went through, but think if, think if all of us were doing that together. And, and I think that is, um, that's what technology does when it starts to really put control back for us, which is, I think, the most exciting moment that it's about personal accountability and responsibility and, and we get to determine uh, what comes of it, yeah. right? And I think so much of what you said uh, was echoed earlier today around uh, consumers' demands, you know, in the food industry. And Absolutely. The food so I think that that's I, I think this yeah. goes to a, a, a really common point. People go through a life journey, and a healthcare journey, trying to answer the basic question, which is, what am I supposed to do next? Exactly. And <laughs> historically in healthcare, that meant go, I got to go ask the doctor because they know. They, they know. <laughs> But now we've got so many other sources, and all these digital companies that are digitally enabled are just another source of what right. do I do next. Right. And, um, and I think this, at the end of the day, what we're seeing is this, this blossoming of answers mm -hmm. and opportunities and choices around and get, try, trying, to, trying to find the source of the answer of what am I supposed to do next. 
in an area that I don't really want to do in the first place. Healthcare is not something any of us aspire to go do. Health is, but healthcare isn't. I think it's fascinating. Um, so, you know, this is a panel on, on digital health, but <clears throat> uh, it's about so much else, as, as you've heard from the panelists so far. And I wanted to dig a little deeper, Karen, with you on the story of an environment you were in, in New Orleans, a number of years ago, where uh, there was no technology. And this was after Katrina. And um, what developed the models that developed you know, almost organically out of that, and what that's taught you about innovation and the need to transform delivery moving forward. And if I and I and don't let me forget, I want to say something about regulation because yes. I may not I may, we may not make it around. But yeah. I really, there's been some touches on that, and I think it's it's yeah. really important. Um, I don't know the answer to any of these things, so I'm just going to throw that out there. But there's a definite tension for me professionally, but also I think in the country between. The, the investments and what we have been building in the traditional healthcare system and seeing that as the solution to sickness and health mm -hmm. and what we intuitively know are the ways that we should be approaching health and maybe even sickness. And over the course of time, the more we invested in kind of the trappings of the traditional healthcare system, the further away the clinicians sort of got from the humanity mm -hmm. of, the, of our patients. And we lost touch with fields like public health or social services or even the business community when, when I think we were more, at a time when we were, we were more of a part of the fabric of a community, we were able to see what was being sold in different places, et cetera. I mean, it was, we had, so that was, a, that was a world that drifted apart. And for us in Katrina, those worlds collided. And they collided um, mostly because all of the walls came down um, or they didn't come down, we were flooded, so everybody was pushed out onto the street and forced to work together in ways that we hadn't ever before. And so for the health care system and the public health system and the social services system, we literally found ourselves on the street introducing ourselves to each other and saying, gosh, there's, uh, yeah, people evacuated, but there's tens of thousands of people here who need help. So I've got a card table, oh, I have an ice chest, oh, I happen to have you know, some, some Band-Aids, let's put it all together, and we would say make gumbo in Louisiana, um, but, but stone soup, whatever you wanna call it, we put all of our stuff together and began working. And what emerged out of that um, was certainly something Cindy was just talking about, was this humanity, because you're on the street, you see the devastation, People's livelihoods and houses were destroyed. It was, we, there was a no us and them. We were in the same place as the people that we were caring for. And, and what naturally grows in that environment is you meet people where they are. You work in teams. You work at the top of your license. You listen. Um, and you really think about how you're going to use every resource to do the best that you can because you know you don't have very many resources. And uh, for us, uh, so aside from humanity and that sort of um, teamwork, it, it, it was the patient-centered medical home. That's what grows mm -hmm. in the wild in primary care. If you take away regulation and walls and um, a schedule and, and whatever else, that's the way people want to work in the healthcare system, which I think was closer to what the people we were serving wanted. But I think we also really quickly learned that um, you couldn't do it on, by, with paper because that's just not scalable. Um, you can't serve people. You can't anticipate. And so that caused us to very quickly um, adopt uh, electronic health records in the clinical environment and, and use that to be able to figure out what, what the needs were of people. So who was returning to the city? Were we seeing more people with diabetes? Was it hypertension? Mm -hmm. What were we gonna need a bag bar or steel to have for resources in the shelter or whatever the next day? And that grew over time into leveraging technology as a way to help us. So specifically, for example, we knew we had a lot of people with mental health challenges. Mm -hmm. People were anxious, they had PTSD. You would forget to ask that because you're busy clinically or trying to scrap together some resources. So we just built it into the EHR. So everybody was asked, universal precautions. Let's not try to guess if you're depressed. Let's just make it a part of the, the routinization of what we do such that, that, that um, you start to build in beyond the physical health components. And we very quickly learned from our patients that it was really lovely if we wrote a great prescription for insulin that was the perfect next treatment for their diabetes. Uh, but if they didn't have a house, it was mm -hmm. sort of stupid. 
and <laughs> that they needed, they had social needs that were higher on their Maslow's list than, than our desire to have clinical excellence. And so we had to self-train and be resourceful about incorporating the social needs into our questions and our, our treatment plan, but more importantly, this sort of gets back to the community building. It was, there was only so much that we as the healthcare system were gonna be able to do. I didn't make the bus routes or build grocery stores. And that's where the public health 3.0 idea, which is what Wellville is, is the community coming together, making a shared decision that they wanna be healthy, not just have a sickness model, and how they then around that clinical excellence and that those caring clinicians that are leveraging technology, whatever it might be at the, t at the day, to partner with others. And that's what builds that community fabric. And I, I, when I say I think I don't know what the answer is going to be is there's this tension is I have this, and I have had since I was national coordinator, this is always one of the things that I said, I, when I came to Washington and I started listening to the country, not just my community, I, I heard people, consumers, screaming frustration about the healthcare system in a way that I had deafened myself to, I think, uh, uh, in my own community. And, and meaning that they felt, they felt isolated and frustrated and confused and disempowered. And they, one, one tool they want is their data. And so we spent a lot of time trying to free data, um, but also try to protect it so that it wasn't just flowing randomly on the streets. And I think that's the point I want to make about regulation. I want to make two points. One, I carried with me this experience of, of Louisiana, of New Orleans, and flexible care environment, which was because we had philanthropy and we were under martial law, and so we could do lots of things. Um, uh, but, but over time, we built this payment model that was a global cap and allowed us to practice primary care like in, with teams in the way we wanted. When that demonstration went away, we, went, we had to go back to the fee-for-service model and you can imagine what happened. We went back to one-on-one -on -one doctor patient visits and had to let go of the community health workers and the medical legal teams and the whole, the things that really mattered to our patient's health and sort of uh, nudged it back. So the payment piece I think is really important. We heard this today and it's not just how you push the money into the healthcare system, but, but you, you said this earlier, it's how you, and I'm not gonna say it right, but it's how you pay and earn or something that was very business-like, and I was gonna say something policy wonky, like <laughs> how you accrue savings into the right pocket, but this is the big challenge from a policy standpoint in our country, is we keep throwing money, 90% of our money in the healthcare system, and it can only do so much. We need to invest in the rest of the yeah. stuff that, in, that influences health. And the second thing, though, is about equity. And, and um, yes, demo d data is democratizing, but it's also a d can divide if we're not careful. Mm -hmm. And so I think as we're all thinking of all the fun stuff we're gonna do with all this great technology, we have to remember people don't have broadband and smartphones or they lose them or they share them or they're terrified of them or what they can't give all the information we think because of their legal status. So there's a lot of, of really ethical and important issues as we think ahead to the future. It shouldn't stop us, but we should be thoughtful. And I think that's a really important role for government it's not really necessarily regulation, but I think it's attending to the sort of the sort of everybody. So thank you for letting me get that in. No, no, and um, <laughs> I uh, we could talk. You know, and I'm, I'm out of government, so it's, <laughs> don't worry, my hands are not on the. I, I, I just want to add a, a public health yeah. twist because okay. uh, mm -hmm. I agree with you completely about the access to technology. But on the other hand, in the world, there are more cell phone users with connected data than there are toothbrush yes. users. <laughs> think about it. Um, so, just to kind of paraphrase what you said, we are renting health right now, and what we need to do is invest in it. Mm -hmm. That's great, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to ask uh, my panelists as we wind down uh, to kind of wear the hat that you wear, you know, in, in sort of your, your, your mission in, in health today, and to look ahead and to say, if you had to pick the single biggest change we're gonna see in the digital health landscape, um, what would that be? And what will be the primary driver of that change? Will it be, you know, primary driver, so don't say all of the above, but will it be <laughs> <laughs> policy and payment reform? Will it be the role of communities and this broadening definition? Will it be technology, you know, technology forward uh, efforts? So, single biggest change we'll see in the landscape and, and the primary driver of it. And we'll start with you, Paul. Okay. Well, it's really easy to predict the future because a lot of the uh, a lot of the future is baked in demographically, both for physicians and uh, people getting older. A lot is baked into the fact that we won't have enough resources to address a growing problem. So that's the background. Fortunately, for chronic disease and diabetes in particular, 
there are ways to approach this epidemic, this tsunami, that I think will happen. I mean, if it's not only the, the be good thing to do, it, it's, there's no choice. There really is no choice to reduce inequity, to leverage scale, uh, to get results. I mean, I, I think it really is an inevitability. Ready to go? Karen? I think um, that we're going to have a digital medical home and not a physical brick and mortar medical home. And it's going to learn about us and mass customize and tell us when we need to connect with humans. And I think the reason for that is probably convenience more than almost anything else because that seems to be a driving cultural desire that we have in this country. Can I push you just a little bit on that one? Do you think that that model is, is a, like a consumer just pays for that model outside of our current payment system, or do you think that there's something that happens to the current payment? Oh, no, I, I think, I think um, people will definitely pay for it. You know, I use, um, so when I was a national, when I was a national coordinator, we, one of our big policy things was to require electronic health record companies to use APIs, doorways to the data, which now every time I say that, I think that is so crazy. Why did we have to make them do that? <laughs> But we did, and um, that w that lo the people would host your data, and you might pay. There'd be a business model, but it occurs to me now that I was wrong, and that what's going to happen is, it, blockchain aside, that um, companies that that know how to play with data want your data because they're going to make money off of it. Um, they're going to sell you things, or sell other people things, or find cures for things with it. So they want to use it for machine learning, and and that will mean that someone's going to be willing to to host it, and and the nudging part. I, I think has to be worked out. I hope it's not only healthcare, because in that, and unless we really get them to a, a better health model and not a sickness model, I hope that really there's some new engine. Maybe it's the payer community. Maybe it's government leads the way. I'm not really sure, but I hope that uh, we we get away from just treating and get get back into. Um, to be, to be sort of wonky, I think this whole thing around big data is going to make a big difference, and it's just like in the ad business this concept of attribution. What was it that made you buy the blue dress? Mm -hmm. What percent was, you saw it on Google? What percent was Karen DeSalvo was wearing something like it three months ago? How much was it the price? Mm -hmm. And in the same way, we're gonna understand much better what is making people healthy. And so we will, right now, the CBO, I believe, still cannot, right. it can talk about the cost of health care, but it can't talk about the benefits of a healthy employed population. And I mean, we've been hearing about all the costs of bad health. So the benefits of good health, of happy workers, uh, you know, empty jails, children feeling good about themselves, those are huge benefits. And we're gonna have the financial wherewithal, not just to understand that, but then the justification for paying for it. That's exciting. Um, five years in, the biggest change we're gonna see and what you think the drivers will be. Am Amazon, as they completely disrupt McKesson's business of supplying doctor's office, completely disrupt the retail pharmacy business, completely destroy the PBM business, possibly maybe 10 years out, and, um, um, and completely disrupt the DME business, all of which well underway. Did you say pharmaceuticals too? Yeah, a far, a retail, retail oh, pharma, not pharmaceuticals, but retail pharma. Retail pharmacy, yeah. yeah. And, and, you and, and you didn't say Echo. Or, uh, oh, uh, you're going to, yeah, you're going to talk to gonna your TV, away. your refrigerator. They're just going to implant your box, right here yeah. in, our, in our throat. Your, your, your car, you'll, you'll, you'll be getting your drugs as you're driving home in the car, and they'll be over there when you're at home. That's well, right. some of us we drive. In five, in five years, we will. Uh, well, that's that's a, maybe not. That actually about. gets the pharmaceutical cool, because there will be bar cars, by the way, uh, since you don't have to drive. Right. Cindy, you have the honor of going last but not least. Yeah, I'll just uh, tag a little bit on to what Don said. Um, I am waiting for the day for one of these home talking devices to tell me something I don't know. <laughs> Uh, tell me something I was curious about or that you realized about me or I broke a pattern that you thought was not good for me or you were going to pat me on the back. Like, I would just love to be surprised by that. Um, and I, I can't go without saying that I'm sure in five years that my ways will have rewired our society tapping into the capacity of humanity. So um, I think we're hungry to do good for each other. You know, you look at the hurricanes, you look at Las Vegas, you look at the fires that we just had in Northern California, and you just can't leave that without visually recognizing how much we want to help each other. So I think the return to that beautiful part of our, of our society 
uh, as enabled by technology is what I'm really looking forward to. All right, well, All right. amen. Uh, so thank you so much for, for joining us today and, and please join me. In